way our service is structured, the way we come to Jesus, you know, we spend this time, uh, you know, thanking him and confessing our need for him and receiving his forgiveness and celebrating what he has done for us. And now it's time to receive his word into our hearts. We're going to begin reading today from Deuteronomy chapter eight. So if you have your Bibles or your devices, you want to turn there, Deuteronomy chapter eight, our reader today is going to be Mary Mayo. But this is the word of God and we need his help because it's not about hearing or receiving information. It's about God working in our hearts through his word. So let's pray for his help. Would you pray with me? Our gracious God, as we receive your word now proclaimed to us, give us humble, teachable, obedient hearts so that we may believe what you have revealed and do what you have commanded. We pray this in the name of our Lord, Jesus, the Messiah. Amen. Good morning. Deuteronomy 8, 2 through 5. There you go. <laughs> now I'm not a headless voice. <laughs> Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and test you in order to know what was in your heart, whether or not you would keep his commands. He humbled you, causing you to hunger and then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors had known to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. Your clothes did not wear out and your feet did not swell during those 40 years. Know then in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so the Lord, your God, disciplines you. Our New Testament reading this morning is Romans 10, 8 through 13. The word is near you. It is in your mouth and in your heart. That is the message concerning faith that we proclaim. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, for it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it is with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Praise God. Our scripture, our gospel reading this morning is from Luke verses 1 through 13. Now Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness. By the way, Jesus was filled with the Holy Spirit because he had just been baptized by John. Where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days. And at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. 
Jesus answered, it is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. If you are the son of God, he said, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Sister Mary. Oh, wow. Uh, we know this story pretty well, don't we? I think uh, I first remember reading it back in the 1970s when I was a little kid. I had a comic book version of, of the Bible, and I remember seeing you know, pictures of Jesus in the comic book version, uh, standing at the pinnacle of the temple. I go, wow, that's a crazy story. right? And this story of the temptation of our Lord Jesus in the wilderness, it raises so many questions. Why was Jesus fasting? Right? We know fasting isn't just about losing weight. <laughs> it, it's a spiritual practice, so we can focus on prayer. Why 40 days? 40 days, and it says he was hungry. No kidding. No kidding. Who is this devil person that shows up out of nowhere? What is the meaning of the three particular temptations laid before Jesus? Could Jesus actually have given in to temptation? If he did, what would that have meant? Right? Lots of questions. Those are just a few. This is a story that is worth much meditation. But I'm going to keep it fairly simple and fairly brief today, relatively speaking. <clears throat> We're going to focus on what it means to us today. Here's what I'm going to try and help us to, to see. What does it mean for us? That our Lord Jesus, the Messiah, our Savior, what does it mean that he was tempted and that he did not give in? And I think we actually get a glimpse of the answers right in those very first two verses, where it says, Jesus, as Mary pointed out, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan where he had been baptized, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil. So that's really, wow. You know, Jesus left the Jordan after having been baptized, identifying with us in our humanity. If you remember way back to the sermon on the baptism of Jesus, right? Demonstrating that repentance is the way to right relationship with God. In response to Jesus' obedience, God pours out his spirit in the form of a dove, proclaims his approval. This is my son, my beloved son, in whom I'm well pleased. And now, still led by the spirit, that same spirit, Jesus heads out into the wilderness to begin this time of fasting, of intense and focused prayer. And then, toward the end of that 40 days, weakened by this experience, he comes under the test. So with that in mind, you know, that whole scenario in mind, I want to just kind of talk with you a little bit about the nature, the nature of temptation, the circumstances of temptation, and the goal of temptation, because there's actually a goal involved. God's goal, not necessarily yours or mine, right? Because I think if we understand what Jesus went through, it helps us to understand what we are going through. If Jesus is he's our Savior, he's not only our Savior, he is also indeed our example. And of course, the reason he can be our example is because he's our Savior. It all works together. So let's look at the nature of temptation. And to do this, I want to hop you back to De Deuteronomy chapter 8. I actually changed the Old Testament reading today because I think this is very instructive for us. And you may have recognized some of the words in the Deuteronomy 8 passage are words that show up in the Luke 4 passage. Isn't that interesting? 
So Moses in Deuteronomy is reviewing the story of Israel. And he says, he says, look, God led you in the wilderness. Why? He says, to test you. Huh. I thought it was just because we messed up. No, God led you into the wilderness to test you. Moses says, he wants to teach you, O Israel, that your life is about more than material comfort or emotional safety. The most important thing that you need to learn, O Israel, God's people, is to trust in God's promise. The most important thing that we need to learn is to trust in God's promise. So what's fascinating about this is it looks as though God uses our suffering. He uses our struggle, our difficulty, and our pain to reveal to us what is really in our hearts. God already knows what's going on in our hearts, but Speaking from my own experience, I know I can be very blind to what's going on in my heart. I can tell myself all kinds of stories about what's going on that has nothing to do with what's actually going on until God smacks me upside the head. I go, oh, oh, right? And we understand this principle. We have a different way of saying it. We like to say, when the chips are down, we find out what a man is really made of. Does that sound familiar? When the chips are down. And God is saying, when the chips are down, I will show you what's really going on in your heart. That's why Moses talks of the wilderness sojourn of his people. 40 years. By the way, 40 years? 40 days? Coincidence? I think not. Right? Moses talks of this as a test. A test. What is a test? It's simply an event that reveals reality. Right? The school teacher wants to know, do the students really know the material? Well, let's give them a test and we'll find out. It reveals the reality. Do you or I really trust in God? The test reveals it. And this is where we can begin to look at and understand how the circumstance, the circumstance of our temptation plays in here. Because it says very specifically in Luke 4, the Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness. It says very specifically in Deuteronomy 8, God led you, O Israel, into the wilderness. So here's Jesus. He's coming off his huge spiritual high, filled with the Spirit. Anybody ever been on a huge spiritual high? (laughs) Right? Filled with the Spirit. And the same Spirit leads him purposely from there directly into suffering and pain and weakness and vulnerability. That, <laughs> yeah, well, uh, Ron says they he could have taken a much shorter, easier out. I can't tell you how many times in some of the worst parts of my life and I finally figure out what God's been trying, or think I figure out what God's trying to tell me. I said, God, couldn't you have just sent me an email? Could, could we just skip this whole thing and you just sent me an email and I would have read it and been good? But I think, I think the reason is because I'm just really not that smart, right? I need something more than that. <clears throat> but here's the thing. Being led from a spiritual high into a place of weakness and vulnerability, from our perspective, it doesn't feel like God is giving us our best life now, right? It doesn't feel to Jesus, he's hungry, 40 days worth, like God is giving him his best life now. And this is disturbing to us. Because if the Father would do this to Jesus, what does this mean for us? This is why we must keep in mind the goal of temptation. Which isn't really temptation at all. It goes back to the word I used earlier. It's testing. Right? It's testing. And I think it's important that we frame it this way, because the word temptation for us in English, it's really more about whether or not we're going to have that extra dessert, right? Whether we're going to indulge in some kind of forbidden desire or not. But what God is after here is something very, very much, much deeper than that, much, much deeper than that. 
And we see that God uses suffering and struggle to reveal the disposition of our hearts, to teach us about faith, to call us to more complete, more, more full reliance upon him. So at his weakest, at his weakest, the accuser comes to Jesus and says, so, think you're so special? Oh, beloved son, think you're so special? Why is God letting you be so hungry if you're so special? Maybe it's time you just made your own bread. Hmm? Right? Have you ever been susceptible to words like that? I have. So the tempter comes to Jesus and says, so, kingdom of God, whew, doesn't look like much of a kingdom now, does it? Come over to my side. I'll show you kingdom. I'll show you kingdom. You see, each of these tests is designed to draw Jesus away from trust in God's purpose and promise. Draw him toward distrust of God and self-reliance. Now, I want to point something out. I want to just hold that thought for a minute. I want to jump us ahead about three years when our Lord Jesus faced another test, his greatest test, not in a wilderness, but in a garden, a garden called Gethsemane. You know the name. You may not know that that word Gethsemane, which I've been practicing saying out loud because it's not easy. It, it just means the olive press, the place of the olive press. It's a place where olives, you know what olives are, right? They're crushed in order to release the beautiful nutritious healing oil that is within them. And Jesus knew in that moment, on that night that he was facing his greatest time of suffering, it was coming. It was coming. And so he prayed and he confessed to God. He said, Father, you know, I would really rather not do this. <laughs> I would really rather not. But then he also says, but the most important thing, Father, isn't what I want. It's what you want. The most important thing isn't what I want. It is what you want. And so our Lord Jesus entered willingly into suffering that we can't imagine, into shame, a shameful death, not just a death, but a shameful death. And he did that for you and for me so that we might be rescued, such is his love for us. So this brings us to consider this goal of testing. For we know that had Jesus not willingly gone into death for us, he would not have been raised from the dead for us. He would not have been exalted to his throne on high. He would not have sent the spirit for us if he had not submitted to being crushed like an olive the oil of his Holy Spirit with which he was filled would not have been released for our anointing today. Jesus was tested for us. Thanks be to God, he passed the test for us. Where Adam failed, Jesus succeeded. Where Moses came up short, Jesus went the distance. Where Israel could not fulfill their calling, Jesus fulfilled all righteousness. We are reminded by the Apostle Paul that all, all who call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Let me suggest that those words of Paul are about way more than that moment when you raised your hand and went forward in a meeting to pray the sinner's prayer. I know that's how many of us initially came to Jesus, right? But I'm suggesting to you that that phrase of the Apostle Paul is about so much more than just that moment. It is about every moment in your past, in your present, and especially now in the days and years to come when you are tested by circumstances. Finding yourself by your circumstances lured into distrust of God. When the pain is great, it's hard to feel anything else, right? Enticed into falling back on your own resources. God doesn't seem to be acting, so I guess I better get busy. That's, 
It's one of my big temptations. When we're drawn into short-circuiting the work of the Holy Spirit, what is the goal of testing? Well, what was the goal of testing for Jesus? Let's go to the word of the Apostle Paul in his letter to the Philippians, where he writes, let us have the same mindset as Christ, who humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. And for this reason, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. Or let's look at the letter to the Hebrews, fixing our eyes on Jesus, who is the pioneer, the one who went before us, who is the perfecter, the completer of our faith. For the joy that set before him, he endured the cross. He scorned the shame of it. He sat down at the right hand of of the throne of God. Let us likewise, whatever you are going through, whatever wilderness you find yourself in, Understand that this may well be God's practical instruction in the faith. Where faith moves from head knowledge to heart knowledge. Where our whole bodies, ourselves, become involved. Where God gives us the opportunity to practice our reliance on him. And thereby practice going stronger in our faith. There's this phrase that's used um, around a bunch of people that I hang out with who subject subject ourselves to crazy amounts of pain and difficulty through doing something stupid like lifting heavy things. And we we justify it by calling it uh, voluntary hardship. Right? Voluntary hardship. A lot of the hardship that we go through in life is not voluntary. Doesn't mean we don't bring it on ourselves, but that's not what we're looking for right? But it's through voluntary hardship of lifting weights that one gets stronger. It's through voluntary hardship of struggling and suffering and relying on God that our faith, he makes our faith stronger. Jesus said, take these words of Jesus, make them yours. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. He never promised to remove us from trouble. I don't like that. But Jesus says it, so I got to take that, right? In this world, you will have trouble. But then he goes on to say, but what? Take heart. Why? I have overcome the world. In this little story, you go, oh, Jesus overcomes the devil. That's kind of (laughs) cool. He did way more than that. In his cross and in his resurrection, he has overcome the world and he has sent us his spirit so that we can take heart. So I'm saying to you, take heart. Resist the devil like Jesus and he will flee from you like Jesus. In the end, we will be exalted like Jesus. Take heart. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.